There are many species of chestnut trees around the world, but the American chestnut species is almost completely extinct in the wild. Before the turn of the 19th century, a disease known as Cryphonectria parasitica, or more widely known as chestnut blight, wiped out more than 99% of chestnut trees. Chestnut blight is not native to North America, so it ravaged the chestnut trees in America that had no resistance to the fungus. Former Harvard biological historian Donald Davis said that many scientists believe that the disease came from Japan. It took really another decade, or certainly half decade, before people began really, you know, really agreeing that yes, the fungus was uh, an Asian fungus from Japanese chestnut trees. Um, and really, the, the smoking gun was a trip that framed. Frank Meyer, he was a famous plant hunter. Frank Meyer had gone to Nikko, Japan, and he saw the fungus growing on Japanese chestnut trees in Nikko, Japan, and he sent shipments of the twigs back to the USDA. And when the USDA plant pathologist analyzed the fungus on these trees and looked at it, they said, yes, definitely this is the same fungus that our American trees have. There are groups of scientists and researchers that are currently focused on the restoration of the American chestnut tree in the wild. A key group is the American Chestnut Foundation. This nonprofit organization has been working on this project for around 40 years and are still making major efforts to restore the American chestnut. The foundation spans multiple states with each state having its own chapter. Berry biology professor Dr. Martin Cipollini said that there is a lot that goes into the foundation. You now, what kind of organization it is, it's, it's, there's all sorts of components to that. So there's basic research, there's citizen science, a lot of involving of volunteers, there's public education and outreach, there's a, a grant seeking and donation to get money to, to, uh, to uh, support the various types of projects. Uh, so it's a really quite a diverse, um, a diverse organization. It's also divided into state chapters. So because American Chestnut occupied essentially the entire eastern seaboard from Maine the whole way down into Mississippi and even down into Florida perhaps, um, there are state chapters developed in each state that are sort of responsible for developing the program towards restoration in their own state. One of these efforts is the crossbreeding of Chinese and American chestnuts. As chestnut blight came over from Asia, the Asian species of chestnut, referred to as Chinese chestnut, are resistant to the blight. Their goal with these hybrid trees is to have a tree that looks and grows like the American chestnut, but has the blight resistance of a Chinese chestnut. Some people might wonder why they are crossbreeding chestnuts instead of just planting Chinese chestnuts since they are already resistant to the blight. Well, Dr. Hill Craddock, a professor at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga, said that Chinese chestnuts can't survive in an American forest. It's not because we don't like the Asian chestnuts. They're perfectly good chestnuts. Um, but because they're not well adapted to the forest here. So I'll give you an example. The Asian species, none of them, Japanese chestnut from Japan or the three Asian, three Chinese species, none of them makes a tall enough tree to compete with the oaks and the elms and the ashes and the beech and the maple and the other kinds of trees we have in our forest here. So the, the forest type here in Appalachia and you know, in the Southeast, the forest canopy is very high. So to compete in that canopy, you have to be a tall tree. The American chestnut species, Castaneda dentata, has another characteristic which allows it to survive in the forest here which is that it's shade tolerant. In other words, it can live as a shrub in the understory for many years, for decades, maybe forever, until it has an opportunity to grow quickly up into the canopy. And none of the Asian species can do that. So they're not shade tolerant. So if you planted Chinese chestnuts out in the woods, they would perish. And we know that from nearly 100 years of observations and experiments. The crossbreeding program is incredibly active, especially during the summer. Many chapters have their own orchard which holds the chestnuts, and each orchard is well documented with the parents and blight resistance of each tree. Then they look at which trees have the qualities they want. Once they find these trees, they bag the female part of the plant 
so that it cannot be pollinated by other trees. Then they collect pollen from the male part of the selected trees, also known as the catkins. Some of the pollen is used on their own trees, but a lot of it is sent out to different chapters so they can pollinate their trees. Junior biology major and chestnut researcher Anna Rose goes into more detail. So the summer was a lot of orchard maintenance and all of that, but some of the really cool things that we got to do was um, we got to pollinate our trees. So we um, we go out um, and we have big trees and orchards that are producing little flowers and we put bags over the flowers because um, they're wind pollinated and insect pollinated. So it prevents the trees from pollinating each other so then we can go in, take the bags off and we have our own pollen that we collect from catkins from other trees and we know the lineage of these trees all the way back, um, exactly what their genes are, how much American is in these trees, how much Chinese, how resistant they are. Um, and so we get to choose the pollen that we put on these trees specifically, so then we, when we get the seeds, we know exactly what this trees, we, these trees' lineage are. The bags are left on so that they can harvest the chestnuts come August. Then they will process the harvest chestnuts before planting them in labeled pots so that they can grow new saplings. Before that, the saplings from last year are tested for blight resistance. The researchers perform a small stem assay, an experiment in which they expose a branch of the sapling to the chestnut blight. Then they observe them to see how far the chestnut blight has spread to determine which of the saplings has more blight resistance. Donald Davis said that compared to today, old conservation efforts were highly uncoordinated. Well, back then, um, it was sort of a hodgepodge kind of everything but the kitchen sink kind of approach where they did everything from apply mud to the trees they were actually there was some some examples of them putting bottles of chemicals hanging from the trees and they would put chemicals in the bottles and then the bottles would go into the bark into in, into the tree and um you know th those methods didn't work uh, but they tried everything, burying nails around the trunks of the trees. Uh, and of course, um, what they did at the New York Botanical Garden was spray them with fungicides. And that was generally what most people did was take the fungicides of the day, spray the trees heavily. And that did work for a while. But generally, after several large rains, the fungicide would wash off, the fungus would attack again, and usually within a year. The, the trees would show signs to the blight. Some may wonder why we need to restore the American chestnut tree back to the southeast region of the U.S. Like many other endangered species, the American chestnut does a lot for its environment. One of these things is that it produces nuts annually. While many trees produce a large number of nuts one year and don't produce them for another three, Chestnuts produce nuts every year, making a reliable food source for the wildlife. Their nuts are also more nutrient rich than most other nuts. They also absorb and store more carbon dioxide than any other tree. This is only some of the factors to why the American chestnut should be restored to the wild. Dr. Martin Cipollini said that chestnut trees were incredibly impactful in multiple ways. But based upon the characteristics of the tree and their abundance, we can kind of get really good guesstimates of how important they were. They were very abundant. They might have been 25% of all the trees in the forest. They produce large fruit crops, nut crops, every year. And that's kind of unusual. Something like an oak may only produce a good crop every few years, but American chestnuts every single year. They produced tall, straight trees that were great for, for timber production. The wood was rot resistant. The bark contained tannins that could be used for tanning hides and that sort of thing. So it was absolutely an incredible a biological resource, human resource, and economic resource. For the folks in the Appalachian Mountains, um, basically their, their entire economies were based around the chestnut. It was really a, a really important tree species for them. The American Chestnut Foundation is making strides to restore the American chestnut to the wild with many different experiments and ideas pushing for the same goal, their conservation efforts are very important for our ecosystem and are a major step to heal our planet. With Viking Fusion News, I'm Louis Durand.